The fountain has been hugely successful in terms of the number of people who have genuinely enjoyed it. And one of the purposes of the fountain is to flirt with the kids and make them think they're safe and they are going to be smarties and go through and stay dry. Whoops! They didn't stay dry. The tricks in the fountain of the balloons and the coffee cups sailing into the air were a bit of a surprise. So I started changing the software as I realized that the kids were as important as the artwork. When Nick DeWolf first arrived in Aspen, he was not interested in talking about his background as an inventor and entrepreneur. When I first came to Aspen 35 years ago, I didn't really want anybody to know what I'd done. I wanted to earn people's respect and a place in the community by what I did and what I was, not what I had been. I was very lucky. I went to a very good university uh, became an engineer, not a scientist, and I learned how to build things and make them work. And I wound up in the semiconductor business when it didn't exist. There was no such thing as semiconductors. There were only 50 of us in the whole planet who even knew what the hell was going on. Wow, what an opportunity for a hard-working young guy. I was very successful along with anybody that worked hard in this wonderfully explosive new semiconductor thing. His philosophy was pure Nick DeWolf. Brash, risky, and groundbreaking. Go out and study your customer's needs. Pay no attention to his demands. Then you can go and design something as new and different and then suddenly may come into huge demand. And that's what I did. But I became the king of the testers for semiconductors. I was born in 1928 at the bottom of the Depression to an upper-class Philadelphia environment. I, early on, only cared about what I knew, not who I knew. There's a devil inside those of us that create. We probably are unhappy about something. We're probably mad at something. We enjoy like mad finding chinks in the armor of the established way of doing things. Our whole job is to plow a hole through one of those chinks and do something really new and different. Nick started his career in Boston as an engineer for General Electric. He lived in the same neighborhood as a young writer named Maggie Lemley. We had a great time. We were a bunch of single people living in Boston on Beacon Hill and everybody got to know everybody else. We were called the sits and jivers and what we did, which was done then, of course, was that we sailed and skied. And we came to Aspen and skied, in fact. He had been in Aspen and broken his leg. On Ruthie's run, I broke my leg. And I was coming up for air after having broken the leg. And it was time for me, I felt, I didn't know it, but it was time for me to get married. He had a, uh, a kind of brace on his leg that clanked. And I remember hearing him clank as he came up the stairs to the apartment. Uh, I clank, clank, clank. It sort of was like Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> there was a blonde across the street, and she was absolutely beautiful, and she was a friend of Maggie's. So I knew Maggie slightly, and this girl slightly. So I said, Maggie, would you fix me up with Pat? And Maggie said, oh, yes, I'll do that. I guess. I said, okay, because I guess I was going to do the cooking. Maggie cooked the dinner. Maggie arranged the whole thing. And within 10 minutes, I decided the hell with a blonde. <laughs> I really went for Maggie. In those days, you had dates. So we had several dates. And uh, then we got married very quickly thereafter. And it looks like it's worked pretty well. We subsequently had six kids, and we're still together. And if anything, we're closer now than we've been the last few years. From humble beginnings above Joe and Nemo's hot dog stand in Boston, Nick and a partner founded Teradyne, and quickly built it into a large public company. Like many an entrepreneur, over time he found himself doing less inventing and more fighting with a growing corporate bureaucracy. Finally, he had enough. Nick had decided it was the right thing to do to retire. We wanted to leave the East with its cold Victorian ideals. And I wanted to be more Western, a little more flip, a little more, hey, have a nice day, it's tubular. I was game for a bit of that. They moved to Aspen in 1972 and settled into a remodeled Victorian on Bleecker Street. It was good to move to another place. I just wanted to arrive, like by parachute, with Maggie and all these kids, six of them, 
Uh, and I wanted us to settle down into this small town. Aspen is just, you are. <laughs> you are what you seem to be. People didn't ask. And I came here because it was one of the most classless towns I could find. The, uh, the stoned freak and the rich folk and the movie star and the Jack Nicholson's and the, and the characters, we all seemed to get along pretty well. We had something to give to each other. One of Nick's early projects was Grassroots TV. He saw a valuable resource where others saw only a mess of old video hardware and red ink. We pulled it right out of the ashes into a different kind of station, and we, by golly, had one of the most adventurous and successful local corny TV stations. In recent years, both Nick and Maggie have been recognized by many local nonprofits for their volunteer work. Nick likes challenges for his quick mind. His ideas come in torrents, and he gives the visitor the sense that he's teetering on the edge of reason, or perhaps a great discovery. Pretty nice, and it might be useful. Yeah, there we go. The thing that's interested me is solving problems that are almost insoluble. The Aspen parking problem, ooh, there's a big one. I could get interested in that. We're in our dining room, which I commandeered some years ago and took over as my what others would call office, and it's my workplace. When our kids come with bringing grandchildren like Matt, I have an agreement. I clear off half this table for the family. There's no way I can organize this. It just has to be a chaotic mess. So if you were to visit here, you'd hear occasionally, damn it, where did I put my glasses? Maggie, on the other hand, is like an air traffic controller for Nick's constant flights of fancy. She emanates calm amidst Nick's charming eccentricities. So one day, we computerized Maggie's spices. Oh. Maggie's sanctuary is her garden, which is her own lush, exotic, and colorful experiment. For the community, she has created kids' science camps, a cookbook to benefit the Aspen Center for Physics, and the science lecture series that bears their name. In the best way to become part of Aspen is to volunteer. Well, I started making this list. I'm not even going to show you the list in a readable form, but the list got longer and longer and longer. Oh my God. And it turns out in the last 30 years here in Aspen, I've been involved in a huge number of projects. He can't help but get seduced by another idea. And I've landed onto a project I'm very fond of right now. These glass plate negatives contain... He is currently scanning the Historical Society's unseen archive of photos from the mining days to make them more accessible to the public. The glass negatives taken in Aspen in 1890 to 1910 are beautiful photographs. Aspen was a lot of fun back then and the photographers captured the spirit and the giggles and the laughs and the affection between Aspenites. It was actually every bit as much fun as it is today, maybe more so. Well, the pictures show a very vibrant community and the town was pretty civilized. That people would get dressed up. They weren't just gruffing in the mines, blowing it up the darn thing, getting killed and hauling silver out. But they did lots of other things. just a certain bursting of liveliness from the Aspenites that I have to admire. I hope that our lives have made this community a little bit more fun. And I've set out to see to it that the fountain can squirt and dance many years after I've died. It will still be dancing 25 years from now. <laughs>